<laughs> hey guys, thanks for the the um the clap there. That's, that's kind of nice. Um, so I've been on the ASP.NET team for about seven years now, and I had two internships before I actually started working there. So it's kind of like nine years. So I've been there for a while. I worked on like web forms. I've worked on anything you could think of that was that was ASP.NET in that time frame. I've probably worked on some of it. Um, so I want to take you through kind of our journey from going from where we are today to where we are, um, where, where we will be in the next 10 years. So ASP.NET 5, have you, if, if you guys have heard of it before, is this brand new cross-platform stuff we've been doing at Microsoft. And it's been, the last two years of my life have been challenging, fun, uh, crazy. You can imagine all the emotions going through an entire rewrite of a stack. Um, as the last speaker just said, the people that, that wrote ASP.NET like, had brains. And it was probably good code 13 years ago. But you know, it was probably time for a reboot like, um, right now. Um, in making this, this um, presentation, I, get, I kept calling it the old stack. And I felt bad because you know, it isn't even done yet, this, this, this new stack. So it's, it's not the old stack, it's the current stack. So if, I, if, if you hear me say old, don't feel bad. You aren't using the old stack, you're using the, the existing stack. This new one isn't even done yet. So um, I don't have any slides. I'm just going to like, show VS and code and navigate through code and show how we built the stack and debug through code. And hopefully, you can follow along with me as we step through the entire like, life cycle of a request from old to new world. Um, so let's, let's get started. Um, I'm sure everyone here has done ASP.NET 4.x before. Um, that's the current stack, not the old stack. Um, so I'm just going <laughs> to create a file new project in, in Visual Studio. And if you have VS 2015, does everyone have 2015 yet? Yeah? Holy crap, that's a lot of people. Um, yeah, so file new project now has uh, these things in here I want. I'll glance over that stuff right now. I'll create a new project. And if you look in 2015, you'll see there are ASP.NET 4 templates and there are 5 templates. You guys see the difference there. Um, there's a small four in the corner. So it's obviously very clear that it's different from ASP.NET 5. Um, so I'll create an empty project. And we'll go through kind of what a request looks like in the current stack uh, at the lowest level. So there's a web config that we all know and love. Um, by default, in, in uh, 2005, we actually put the compilers in there by default so you get Roslyn in your ASPX pages and your um, register pages. Um, so I'm going to create uh, a basic handler. I actually have it here in my quick add. Um, handler one is fine, the client name. And here we have a basic handler. Everyone knows this class, right? ISTB handler. Um, you get a request, you set the uh, content type to plain, you write your response to write. The first thing you, you'll, you'll notice is that this is synchronous. There's no async at all by, by, um, by default in ASP.NET 4X. You can do it, it is possible, but the original design was very synchronous. Um, that's kind of one an artifact of the timeline. 13 years ago, people didn't write async code. Highly concurrent servers were not a big thing. People, people didn't have um, microservices. It was very page-based, so this was all fine back then. And the interface is pretty simple. Um, it has is reusable, which I, I never know to return true or false. I always return false. Um, and process request was kind of the, the main thing you do. So if I hit uh, Control F5 and I run this thing in Edge, do you guys use Edge? Any Edge users? Yeah? Yeah. I use it. <laughs> I use Edge because I can't get Chrome to work properly anymore. So I just give it an, and it's not bad. I mean, it's actually pretty fast. So hats off to the IE team. Um, I'll run Hello One at ASHS and it prints Hello World. So the question is, like, how did that actually work? What happened? Like, who handled the request? Why did it come into managed code like, in the first place? Um, if you're used to IS, there was in the past a thing called an, an Asapi filter in IS6, it was the native component that was in IS that said, whenever a request comes in for this extension, use this thing to execute it. And if you look at the um, application was config, and there's a change in VS 2015 where the config is actually local to the, to the project, which is kind of nice. I can actually open it easily. If I search for ASHX, you'll see there's a bunch of mappings here that says, simpler page handler factory for this extension, for these verbs, execute this module. Um, and that's how IS knows to actually invoke our code for that extension. If you keep searching for ASHX, you'll see more, more entries. Um, there's the integrated mode. So this is the simpler handler factory integrated 4.0 that says for this handler, for these verbs, um, use this handler factory. This factory will create instances of my handler and then invoke me whenever a request comes in. So IS6 was the SAPI filters, IS7 was the, the integrated pipeline, and that's how IS knows to invoke managed code whenever a request comes in. Um, if you look at our, the intrinsics 
in HTTP context, if, if anyone has ever done this before, you'll see to create an HTTP context, you need to create a worker request. The worker request is the abstract layer that sits in between the server and the HTTP context that actually abstracts server stuff. Um, in like, it was supposed to be server agnostic, but if you look at the actual class, it's kind of an abstract based class where the base class is really IIS servers. So if your server looks like IIS, it'll probably work better. Um, the things on here are, are pretty generic for the most part, except for things like get Apple ID. Um, so it's possible to actually implement uh, an, an ASP.NET 4X server in a self-hosted way, but it's very, very difficult. And the actual like, hosting model for doing it wasn't intended for it. So Mono has actually implemented ASP.NET on Apache, and, and, and they have a fast CGI port. But it doesn't work very well. Um, a bunch of features actually don't exist at this layer. So building this new platform, we wanted to have a model that was designed to be server agnostic from the beginning. This is very IS specific. Um, this is going to be these types. Get user token. This is very Windows all specific. It's an int pointer like that doesn't exist on other servers. It's kind of weird. Um, map path is a very IS specific feature. It maps IS um, vders to physical paths. Um, so the abstractions in it were, were intended to be generic, but ended up being IS specific as time went by. Is actually if you go onto um, since we're all open source now, if you go onto Microsoft and I go on here every few because it's fun to read through this code. If you go to Microsoft Reference Source, this has all the source code that will be open source for the entire .NET framework for the current one, not the core CLR. And if you search for, like, um, I actually search for this sometimes, IS7 worker request, you search for this thing, you'll see that we started off having these super generic um, abstractions that work really well. And then we start to special case, you know, is IS7 worker request and do this. So the abstraction kind of leaked out through the entire code base. And ASP.NET became, over time, more IS specific as we you know, kind of went, went, went by. So if we look at uh, the other way you can plug in into the pipeline, you can write a module. So you could write a public uh, module and implement IHTTP module. And this gave you more control of the entire pipeline. So in init, your job was to hook the application and handle the fixed pipeline events that we had in the stack. And these events were very, tight, were very closely tied to the IS events. So if you want to hook begin request, um, you could hook begin request. And end modules could, could all wire up to the begin request, and we'd call them in order. Um, you had to do certain things in certain stages. So authenticate request, if you had um, a, a module that, that, that wanted to set the principle, you had to do it in that, in that stage. And these things didn't really compose well. Um, so you had to kind of know the order of which things ran in. Um, map request handler, when does that run in, in relationship to like post authenticate request? So we kind of added more events to get in between specific cases as, as time goes by. And it's kind of got into a, it kind of got kind of messy. And there were some you were actually supposed to use ever, like pre-send request headers. This one is very dangerous um, if you actually use it. Um, so this was kind of the current model where you have modules if you want a, a scope of the entire universe, handlers for individual requests. Um, so there was two ways to extend the actual pipeline. As time went by and things like Owen came out, um, they actually affected how we built uh, our stuff in SP.NET. And we actually had a project called Katana. Have you guys seen Katana? Use it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's the Microsoft Owen Star uh, assemblies. Those were the Katana project. And the entire intent was to bring Owen to Microsoft stack. Um, so if I create a file new MVC 5 project, not ASP.NET 5, MVC 5. So the, the versions I know are wonky, but MVC 6 is built on ASP.NET 5. ASP MVC 5 is built on ASP.NET 4. Core CLR 1. Let's see, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, if I make an MVC5 project, and if this loads before my talk is over, this is a powerful computer. It's a MacBook Pro. I want Surface, but the those look pretty cool. <laughs> Surface. <laughs> um, yeah. So in the latest projects, the the we have a global ASX as you're used to before, and there's also a startup class. And this class is where Katana started to show up in our projects, and it showed up because of authentication. We actually built a bunch of middleware for Twitter. Uh, Facebook, uh, no, Snapchat, whatever we built, different, different um, third-party providers. Um, and this was the way we hooked Owen into the Ethernet pipeline. This was kind of crude. Um, it was kind of a hack, but it was a clever hack where you still need to run middleware in the correct IS pipeline stages. So we actually, when you, when, when you call this pipeline, it isn't linear. It's actually running it in the correct stage in the, in the integrated pipeline. So behind the scenes, we actually swap, have a module behind the scenes that actually scoops up the, these calls and puts it into individual like 
uh, pipeline stages in the in the request. And that kind of works sometimes until it doesn't work. And then you're kind of like, why isn't my thing working? I put this before that. It should do what it's supposed to do, right? Um, so it's kind of a leaky abstraction. So when we started doing ASP.NET 5, we decided to start from Katana as a base. Um, so, so as a clean slate, what would, what would the world look like if we only ever had Katana middleware in the pipeline without having the integrated pipeline or modules, or we didn't assume anything about the server that was running under the stack, un, uh, under the hood. Um, so if you create an ASP.NET 5 project, using the same dialog for the other ones, <coughs> you'll see, first of all, this is blue. So, so you know it's newer, because green is old and blue is new. <laughs> Sorry, current, not old. old. Yeah. Um, new project system, I'll glaze over that for a second, but the startup class is pretty similar, right? Um, it's a class called startup. It has an application builder instead of an IAP builder. That's, that was done on purpose. We didn't want to confuse with that. It, it was Katana. It's, it's, it's not Katana. We took the, the, the Katana code base, and we kind of morphed it into what we want it to be for the, for the new stack. Um, configure services is how you wipe your dependencies for dependency injection. I'm going to erase it for now because you don't need it if you're doing very simple middleware stuff like printing out Hello World. Um, so if you look at this application, it's very simple. It has this thing, which I won't explain yet, but it will be interesting in the future. I'm running a beta 8 build. This is like a maybe two days ago build that just came out, so it kind of mostly works. But they did find like a lot of bugs in the last week. I, I went upstairs and I stopped typing an email, and they were like, I think like 10 bugs found just in the last week, just trying to get the actual thing to ship. So, but hopefully on Monday we'll be good to go, and you can have it. But you know, I'm like a, 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 I'm testing out the the build right now. So if it fails, I'll just walk off stage, and <laughs> you guys can go <laughs> to the party early. Um, so let's. Ooh, Microsoft Edge. That's the wrong one. There we go. So I will run this now. Um, Let's run this web command. It will boot up the server. I have tracing on because I, I always debug stuff, so I you can ignore all this stuff and look at the, the meat down here. So I'm running in the, the development environment. I'm running on port 5000. So I can go here and run localhost 5000, and it prints hello world. No surprise, right? So what happened? The pipeline in this model is very, very different from what we had before with the handles and the modules. There is no stages, right? You have a linear pipeline, and that's all you get. So you write middleware in line, and that's your whole pipeline. Uh, as an example, the lowest form of middleware is really uh, F12 on use. Use is a funk of request delegate to request delegate. And that's not confusing at all. Um, th it's funny, uh, Owen had, before it became what it is today, it went through a bunch of different stages, and there was this thing called the, the delegate of doom, where it was like a funk with a funk with a funk all nested, and it was like 10 funks, and no one could figure out how to use it. Um, um, we kind of toned it down a little bit in, in ASP.NET 5. We still have that to some extent, but it's a lot cleaner. Um, so a funk request delegate, request delegate. Um, this guy is actually uh, the, it, it's the equivalent of process request on a handler. So you take in a context, and the, and the assumption is you're doing async work, so return task. So at the lowest level, um, if I did my middleware, my coach in this guy, I get handed in the next middleware in line, and it's my job to do something interesting right here. So this middleware, by default, is going to pass through. So I'm going to call uh, call next on context here. And the way middleware runs is the, the order is, 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 is uh, very relevant. So you have to put middleware in the correct order for it to run in that order. I've seen people file bugs where they say my middleware isn't being effective. It's because you probably ran it after, not before, where it should be in the pipeline. So middleware doesn't have a chance to run like at arbitrary points. You have to, the user has to know where to put the middleware in the pipeline for it to actually be effective. So to show this, I'll put a breakpoint here and here. So you can see the effect of like, stepping through middleware and seeing what actually happens. So if I actually F5 this, and the server boots up, and I hit F5. The call stack has the call to next right here in my middleware. So what happened was it built the pipeline, and now it's giving me control of the, the request, and I can run whatever I want to run here. But I'm choosing to run the next guy in line directly. So if I hit F12, you'll see that the next calling next actually 
runs that stack frame like in line. So when you call next, you're actually running the next middleware over and over. And this kind of explains why if you don't actually have the middleware in the correct order, you don't run. Um, so I'm stepping right into the next guy directly. And that calls the next. He runs right, right, hello world, and that, that runs just fine. So the question comes up sometimes, what happens if you don't call next? What do you think happens? If I comment this out and return task. Dot should be a task dot empty. That'd be nice. If I do this, then what do you think happens? Nothing, right? Yeah, because of course. So there's been complaints about you know middleware being hard to know whenever it will call you or not. So the convention we've been using is run means it's terminal, and use means it may it won't it most likely won't be terminal. Um, use can still be terminal in the case where it does handle the request. Uh, for example, in routing, the, the routing middleware will go through its routes, try to actually hit the endpoints, but if the endpoint isn't configured, it'll fall through. If it is configured, it won't fall through. So you'd say, like, use routing, blah, and routing passes through if you happen to actually fall through that, that, that um, code path. So if you write middleware in general, you should say use blah as your middleware if you're going to pass through, and run blah if you're terminal. Um, so signaler and in, in Ethernet 5 is the run signaler. Run signaler, signaler is always terminal. Once you hit that branch, you will end up in that pipeline and we will never fall through. Um, unless by design. So middleware at, at the list level is, is a simple function. We do have ways to make it easier to write. Um, if you do add new item and you search for middleware class, I did my middleware. You see, you, you have a class here that takes in the next next guy, and invoke calls next by default, so it's passed through. We also give you a public static extension method on application builder by default that configures your middleware. And our recommendation is you expose these things with options so, you can, so people that can configure middleware very easily. So in startup class, I can do app dot use my middleware directly, so people don't have to learn how to wire up funks of funks of funks. You just expose a very nice method on app builder that actually shows you how to actually wire up the thing internally. Um, middleware can get services if you wanted to get at them. Um, use middleware of T. You can actually call, you know, add services in the configure services. And in here, you can take more arguments. Like I could take the iLogger, for example, and have uh, a middleware log things like request begin, request end. Um, it's a very powerful concept. So you get the view of the entire kind of pipeline within your own view. So within here, I can actually run next and have code that runs before and after calling next. So for example, let's say I wanted to see the status code from calling after going through, going, going through the pipeline. I can just await next. And here I'm like uh, on the way in. And right here it's on the way out. So by the time you're on the way out, the status code has probably you know, been set. So I can say like context.status if the status code ends up being sorry, res response.status if it ends up being you know, 500 or something else something, uh, or something like that. Um, middleware can also uh, change the HTTP context on the way in. So let's say you want to implement something like buffering. Um, you could say whenever somebody writes a response, I want to see it so I can actually like, compress on the way out. So middleware gets control of the entire context and can change things before it, it goes to the next guy. And when on the way out, you can revert that change. So people above you don't see that change that, that um, you modified. Um, let's take a look at the HTTP context and the intrinsics for this new model. So we wanted to have the things be familiar, so we did have the same class names, HTTP context, request, response. And it's kind of hard to name those things. I mean, like, they're pretty generic, so it kind of makes sense to reuse the same terms. This is a very lightweight version of what we had in System Web. We call this the God object. So we knew it would grow bigger over time, because it will grow bigger over time. It just happens to be that way. So we call these small things demigods, uh, authentication manager. It's kind, of, it's kind of, we want to group things into logical units. Um, and have things in the top level that were very, very like commonly used. And this is all very touchy-feely. This isn't like a science. We kind of go through it and say, like, what do most applications use whenever they like are in middleware? What do you want to use? A request form? You want to get like uh, the connection information, for example. You want to get the IP address, uh, the client cert. That's kind of rare, but still. Um, IP address, remote IP address, that kind of stuff. Uh, we group things like, oh, too far. We group things like WebSockets together so that if you're doing WebSocket stuff, you can get everything on this guy. And we actually plan to extend each of those demigods and add more of them as time passes by, as more things come, come out, like um, HTTP2, if you have to add more things there. Um, 
more things. You have request aborted, so when the, the client disconnects, you can actually detect it. Uh, request services, more for DI stuff. Um, session is a weird one. that We had a big argument about if this should be on the context, and it's like so many battles. Just It's bad, you should never use session, but we ended up adding it anyway because people, that, like, pe people want to be there. It's, 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 a, it's a thing you'd expect to be there. Um, one funny thing about the existing HTTP context in the, not the old stack, the current stack, the current stack. Um, we were going through this context to figure out what we should add back to the other context because, you know, these were here for a reason. Like, no one just, like, we didn't make one day and, like, just guess these things around here. This kind of grew over time. So if you look at HTTP response, I think, we found this super weird function. No, it was request, request, actually. And I'm not sure what it was for, but you can tell it, it's, it's a relic of its time. Map image coordinates. Like, why is this on here, on the request? Does anyone know what this is for? I mean, it says what it does, but I'm not sure what this is on the context. Like, it just seems weird to me. But apparently, at the time, this was so important that we had to put this on the first class request object. So <laughs> it's an interesting little thing that we found. So the primitives in the new stack are I application builder, uh, middleware, and HTTP context and request delegates. Uh, those are kind of the things that build up the entire stack. And once you have those things, you can you can build applications. Um, so let's take a look at what what the HTTP context is actually doing under the covers. HTTP context is an abstract based class, unlike the other version, which was actually a concrete class. This class is actually a wrapper around this thing called the feature collection. I've seen people ask on on Twitter like, what is this feature collection? What is this weird thing you guys have? Um, the way this was, this, in, this, this was intended to work was that the HTTP con is actually a, a higher level abstraction over the lower level features. So features are very granular interfaces that, that have very specific behavior. So for example, if you look at, um, before let's actually go through the feature collection, it pretty much looks like a, it, it was a dictionary of a type to object. It's, it looks like ISR better a little bit, uh, where you can say this interface uses this implementation. Um, and the revision is just a way that we can cache Whenever you have a feature, you don't have to ch like check the feature collection again if the revision hasn't changed since you last checked it. So this is an observation of um, how we actually implement the feature collection. But the lowest layer, all it is, is a bag of features that you can actually get and set. And that's very powerful, um, what you can do with it. So as an example of that, let us look at some of the features that we have. So if, if you dig into the Microsoft ASP.NET HTTP features namespace, there's a whole bunch of features. Is that big enough? It is. That's nice. Um, there's buffering feature, the connection feature, request feature, and they're all very small interfaces that that all build up to build this uh, this, um, this this giant context object. So if you look at the basic ones, like the request feature, um, when you're implementing a, a server, you have to implement the request feature, and the idea is that these are very low-level interfaces. They don't have like form parsing. They don't have higher-level things. They're very low-level, and they expose like, the request body. So the HTTP context has read form, read form async built on top of the request body, and that's a, a thing that's built on top. So, it, so the, 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 the server itself doesn't have to understand parsing parsing form bodies. All it does is it exposes a stream for the body. So it's kind of a split between the lowest layers and the higher level application layer. Um, so that is interesting. And there's the response feature, the two basic ones, body, the stream, has started, the request started, um, headers, reason phrase, easy things. Um, one interesting fact about ASP.NET current versus the new stack, the current stack, when you call response.write, it actually buffers in memory forever. And if you write and, and you never flush, you actually not have any more memory per request. Um, in ASP.NET 5, we tried to not we try to not normalize behavior between servers because the intent, because you may be actually choosing a server for its, for its unique behaviors. So we, we need to have things like on completed and on starting in case the server isn't buffering. You can actually handle, you get a last chance to write to the re request before it goes out on the wire. So if you hook on starting, whenever someone calls write, if that server isn't buffering, you want to handle like things like changing headers at the last minute. You can't assume that the entire thing is being buffered. So you can hook this thing and figure out if, you, if you're about to be um, flushed to the response, you can do more stuff there. So we have these things on the actual interface so, so that service can, can expose this functionality to the application layer. Um, so there's another feature that's pretty rare but interesting I want to talk about, a send file. Um, in HTTP.sys, that is the Windows component for parsing HTTP. 
on Windows, HTTP is actually parsed in the kernel. Um, and it's very fast, but it's in the kernel. So, so, so it means you need a new kernel for changes. So double-edged sword. Um, send file async is a feature where you can pass in a file and offset in a length. And pretty much the kernel mode driver will read the file in kernel mode, never going into user mode, and build it into the response very fast. Um, if, so if your server has this feature, it's probably going to do very efficient uh, static file serving. In fact, on, on IIS, the, the static file serving is very, 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 very fast and, and actually really hard to beat. Um, so there's a feature in the collection that says, if you're on a server that happens to have this behavior, you can, you can, you can ask for it and then use this feature to send files to disk very quickly. Um, so for example, let us try to use it in this thing. Let me get rid of this stuff. So I can say something like context.response.support send file. This is an extension method we have that checks for the feature in the, in the, um, in the current feature collection. Um, if you do have send file, or if, you, well, if you don't have it, let's say no send file sad face. If you do have it, then we're going to write a file to the response. Let me create a file first. Uh, What's hello in Swedish? I don't even know. Is it is it hello? Hey? No. What? <laughs> J? <laughs> H E J. Ah. That's good. That's good. I learned some stuff today. All right, so if you support send a file, I need to get the actual application base so I can find the file on disk. Application environment, uh, app env. And we don't have any more statics, and it may be to a fault, but we, if you have a static, it's hard to test stuff, so we kind of inject everything that we can. So even the application base, which normally is like a static somewhere you do like current dot give me the base, we pass it in via DI, so. Um, Path.combine, application base path, and ah, delete.txt. And I can say if support send file context.response.send file async. And these are both ex extension methods on send file. So this actually calls get feature if it exists, then call through the interface. Oh, wait, send file. So if I run this right now and hit 5,000, it says no send file. So on Kestrel, our cross-platform server does not have send file. It's built on, it's, it's built on libuv uh, send file. It's actually a socket API, but it's very inefficient, so it's not uh, in libuv itself. And this feature is not working. So what middleware can do is polyfill features that aren't there on the server. So you can have middleware that said, um, I'm going to change this middleware to be a uh, send file polyfill. So send file. And what this thing will do is say, if the server doesn't support send file, or if nobody added it before me, uh, response dot support send file. If it's not supported, then I'm going to create one myself. Response dot uh, response features dot set. I have to add the namespace. Uh, do you guys use this feature? Control dot. Control dot enter. Whenever I see someone hit like right click and resolve, I just freak out because control dot is like how you you code really fast. Um, HTTP send file feature. Control dot enter. And I can just do new send file. I need to pass in the response body, because I'm going to write to the response body. So context.response.body. Control dot generate class. Control dot will save your life. Just keep using it. Control dot interface. Control dot rename. <laughs> um, so yeah. So right now, we're going to implement send file by doing something very obvious, um, doing a using. And get in the stream, uh, file.openread, 
path. Uh, stream dot probably want to seek to the offset origin, and then we're gonna call. So using you probably want to have async await because using it in a finally in, in, in an async task does some very uh, strange things to actually dispose at the right time. So if, if you didn't have the async, you'd probably be like have really buggy code. Actually, it happens a lot. If you do this, stream dot uh, copy to async uh, body, you're in no man's land here. You'll dispose the stream at some random time, and maybe you haven't even copied yet, and you're disposing the stream before you actually return. So you want to do async method here so that you can actually generate the right things in the finally for disposing. So I'm going to await this. And that's it. That's then file. Well, I should probably do something with this, this token. I'll probably like, have to write something like 10, 24, and then cancellation. There we go. That's more complete now. So what's happening here is this send file polyfill is going to add the feature to the collection so that code up the stack doesn't even have to worry about if it's, if it's not there or not. So it's kind of lying because like this isn't an efficient send file, but all software is lie, right? So they're all abstractions. Um, so if I just run this now, it should print. Hey, oh yeah, look at that in Swedish. Works well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So in a more realistic example of how Polyfill actually works in a in a real scenario, web sockets is built on top of his, I guess know how web, web, WebSockets works. The client sends a request to upgrade to WebSocket connection. The server then re replies with, with an upgrade and then says, changes, changes the status to 101, uh, changing protocols. And in Kestrel, we actually implement this thing called an OPIC upgrade stream. So there's a feature called um, upgrade feature, which gives you access to the actual, the raw underlying stream, the bidirectional request stream. And this feature just says, is the request upgradable? Did, did the client send an upgrade? If it is, upgrade is saying, get me the stream. This stream is the raw stream that sits between the request and response. Things like HTTP2 are built on OPIC upgrades, so is WebSockets. So we have this middleware. Um, is that big enough? It is. It's kind of cool being open source against through GitHub, without having to like have it on my machine. Um, this middleware takes the OPIC stream as a feature and says, if the server itself does not have WebSockets, I'm going to polyfill WebSockets on top of the OPIC upgrade by implementing it in managed code. So it's a really cool way to get features built on top of other features in a very composable manner. So this guy says, I'm going to create WebSocket feature using the upgrade feature from the server that, came, that gave me it. Um, and what happens here when you call accept is it does some header stuff with the protocols. And then it calls upgrade async, which, which sends the one-on-one to the, to the client. And then we just create a WebSocket over that stream. This WebSocket actually handles all the framing and all the protocol stuff in managed code. So we pretty much have uh, an implementation of WebSockets that, can, that works in managed code on, it, on any server that implements OPIC upgrades. So it's kind of nice. If more servers come online that support OPIC up upgrades, WebSockets will just work for them without having to worry about actually implementing the entire protocol and all the framing and all the stuff you have to follow, like reading all this all the masking, sending random bytes. Uh, so this is all handled for you by the upper layers of the stack. So it's a nice way to compose the actual framework. When we did WebSockets in ASP.NET current, we actually had to change like IS and ASP.NET, and it was a big effort to make it to pump it through the entire system. This kind of is just managed code that sits on top of the current stack without having to change like anything, pretty much. So it kind of shows you how like, the layering in this new stack is, is, is a lot better because you don't have this giant like piece of software doing everything that has to be changed like all the time. You can just build stuff on top of the the, the, the lower layers with um with the right abstractions. It's kind of a nice uh, feature. We also have um, buffering, the buffering middleware. That is another thing that shows up how to use the polyfill esque thing. Um, so we have a repo called Basic Middleware that adds support for buffering in case you want that behavior again. If you want to buffer all the responses before it goes out to do like compression or anything, you can use the buffering middleware. And there's a feature that says that actually says, I want to disable all buffering altogether. So this guy actually implements buffering and then enables the feature to turn it off so that if you want to turn it off like normal, it will respect the feature that says disable buffering as well. So it kind of shows you how if you're doing middleware authoring, you kind of need to do, be aware of the features that are in the box so that when people ask for features and, and expect certain behaviors, that you respect those behaviors as well. 
Um, so that just an example of how middleware can be used to compose features and stuff. All right. Uh, middleware. So before, system web used to have all the behavior baked into it. So the error page, you couldn't turn off. People would always ask, how do I make the error page not show up for my APIs? And that's because like during that time, it was really built for like page development. Like you were you were doing like ASPX pages and you had an error and you had it uh, a yellow screen to death, and that was like nice. It is still sometimes when you're doing like for when, when you're actually trying to code APIs, it's, it's terrible, right? So you, you don't want it. So by default, like in our stack, and this may be extreme, but if you throw an exception, you get this wonderful now I'm gonna use everywhere. Because knowing less Swedish, um, if I run this, let me secure this polyfill stuff. I run this and then hit the browser. I get nothing. That's very useful, right? Um, so to actually see errors, you have to like install the package. Let's see if the internet is working. Microsoft. We have IntelliSense for packages. It's kind of nice. Uh, we have to know which one to get, so it's kind of a, how do you know, right? Uh, diagnostics. I happen to know because I work on the product. So you can ask me on Twitter, I'll tell you. Um, diagnostics, and that will install the package. And then I can call app.useDeveloperException page. So we, we actually renamed this from use error page so you would feel bad if you had this in production and it was called developer exception page. So there you go. If you, if you, if you deploy like this, this is your fault. We can't even save you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there you go. So, so you have to kind of add all the components to your pipeline to actually get behaviors that, that you had before. And we actually have a lot of arguments about how much is too much. Like how far do we go? Like where is the breaking point? Like how do you, how do you have like a, a, a stack where it's pay as you go and you only get what you want when you need it? versus having some default behaviors in the box so you don't end up like hunting for middleware whenever you need like basic functionality. So our, our kind of balance is when you do file new project for a, a non-empty project, we kind of add enough middleware there and show you how to use it so that it's kind of a template for how you should do like a regular application. Hope that makes sense. Let's talk about the changes that we made to the, to the IIS hosting model in the latest update. So if you guys are following along, we actually changed how we're going to host IS applications. There was a thing called um, Helios before that was used to, um, to host on IS, ASP.NET 5. And it was a, a super clever hack um, done by one of our developers where we put uh, a, 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 a plugin in the box where in .NET 4.5.1, there was a hook that we put in that said, if you have a DLL in the bin folder called this, use that instead of using the regular stuff. So it's kind of this like magical hat that, that no one kind of knew about. We, we kind of used it in, in ASP.NET 5 as like, we can host on any server that has .NET 4.5.1 today, which is all servers, and we can actually get away from using system web and the old, the old intrinsics. So we used that for, for about seven betas, and it, it served this well. It was, it was, it was pretty good. Um, it was kind of hacky in what it did and how it booted up. It actually created three app domains in the beginning that were all alive to keep things around. It, it, it booted core CLR based on full CLR. It was very, very hacky. Um, but it worked very well, and it was very fast. Um, instead of that, we decided to run on Windows the same way we run on Linux out of process. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a, a module written by the IIS team um, that came out for Azure recently. It's called the HTTP Platform Handler. And this handler is used to host anything, pretty much that can that that has it. And I, oh, this is a channel line. I watch a video on stage. <laughs> Blog post by Scott Hanselman. Um, and it, and it, what it does, it pretty much you configure IS to to launch a process. IS sends the port via an environment variable, and then the the child process just reads that port and hosts their server. And IS forwards request to the child server. Um, if I actually run this thing, let me. Put back hello world. Uh, actually, just return that response. That right async. Hello world. Um, so if I run this in with IS Express, it should look like it did before. It shouldn't feel different in VS. Actually, that it took a lot of work to actually make that happen because it was a very different 
way to, to wire it up. And the, what's actually happening here, if I look at Process Explorer, that I happen to have sitting in my taskbar, ha, 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 ha. Um, oh no, I have two of them, crap. Which one is it? Three. Oh no, anyway. Trust me, <laughs> it's not that one, it's not that one, it's not that, it's not that one, it's this one. So Ice Express boots the child process, DNX, and it actually, if you look at the environment here, um, you can actually see what it did. The platform port that it passed to, to us was 15.661, so if I actually hit that in the browser, So it works, hello world. So this is IS, and that's Castro. Same server, just forward and via the reverse proxy. So things you get from using IS still, you get the process management, so whenever like you're leaking memory, IS reboots the server every 25 hours, I think. I don't even know why it's 25, but that's, that's what it does. Um, you, you get the, the management, so you can like set up, set up limits for, for IS. Um, you get the app pool recycling. So you still get all the, 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 the features from IS. The difference is that it, you're running now out of process, so things we used to do like are it's possible, but it's it's kind of harder to do. Um, you need to marshal data back and forth over the wire. Um, for example, Windows off, IS Express um, IS takes the the authentication token, dupes it into the actual child process, and we have to read it via header, pass it into a Windows token, and then flow it to the application as a Windows off user. So this middleware that we have in the pipeline, this use IS platform handler does a whole bunch of work that where IS forwards specific headers and we turn it into the correct objects on their HTTP request and that flows to the application like normal. So when um, you have an HTTPS endpoint, for example, HTTPS terminates at the front end and the back end actually sends an HTTP connection. But we forward the scheme, the original scheme from the request via header and then this middleware takes that scheme and puts it back on the request as if it were an HTTP request, S request from the very beginning. So you don't see an HTTP coming into your server. Um, and that's kind of how it, it does stuff today. Um, does that make sense? Yeah? Um, all right. Let's shift gears and talk about some more open source stuff. So as part of this project, we tried really hard to, to decouple ASP.NET from itself. That kind of sounds weird. Um, we built a new stack, but we wanted to also build a platform for people like Nancy to build on top of in the future. Um, Nancy, I said Nancy, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so this time around, we built in things like form parsing, query string parsing, HTTP parsing as separate components that didn't actually understand our intrinsic objects. So let's say Nancy has their own HTTP request in HTTP context. Um, they actually use this package that, that is supposed to be standalone. And it has no dependencies, so you can use it to just do arbitrary like parsing of data for your own uh, servers or whatever you did. Um, the, for example, reading a form seems trivial. It's actually very difficult to do properly and securely. So for example, if you're reading the form and the form body is huge, right? You don't want to read it onto memory. So after a certain threshold, we buffer on disk if you get past like, I don't know, like I don't know, a couple megs, right? And that logic is all embedded in, in this, this class. So like this can be used by anyone that wanted that same behavior without having to rewrite that, 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 that um, hard logic. And there's all kinds of like DOS attacks you can do by just using the wrong structures to parse things into dictionaries of strings and lists. Um, so we, th it's kind of like a very heavily security reviewed set of parsing code that you can actually reuse in your application if you want to. So we try really hard to decouple our stack from itself so that when people are trying to use our stack, they can actually use the pieces standalone without having to pull in the entire stack. And actually, it, it's a double-edged sword because it's good for everyone, but it sometimes leads us to do dumb things like over-abstract our own stuff. So it's like. We have this class, and we're parsing HTTP into a dictionary because we don't want the, the higher level interface to be exposed at the low level because that would pull in more dependencies. So we ended up wrapping collections of collections of collections in the same collections and allocating too much memory. So we actually are changing some of that stuff now to make things more, more um, generic under the covers. Um, so yeah, that's, that's also something that we've done. That's pretty cool. Um, let's talk about servers. Um, we have two servers now, we used to have, I guess, well, we still have IS, but that doesn't count anymore because IS kind of just runs the child server um, out of process. So we have two servers that, that we have, um, our Kestrel. Kestrel is a cross-platform server that uses LibUV. Um, LibUV is the underlying networking OS abstraction layer for Node.js, if you're not aware of what, what it is. Um, and we have WebListener, 
Has anyone used HTTP listener today in .NET? So that WebListener is the, the logical successor to, to the HTTP listener. It's a much more efficient version of it. We actually took the code. So that's the one thing that isn't open source yet. And I tried to get it open source before I came here, but argh, it didn't. Yeah, if you copy code that isn't open source, it's kind of hard to make it open source. It takes a, a while. Um, but I'll just show you the, the uh, private. Haha, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> yeah, so you didn't see this. But that code is a CPU listener, but gutted and rejiggered to not be as inefficient. I'm um, not saying it's terrible, but the one that we have actually cleans up a lot of stuff. Um, so that one is built on HTTP.sys, and Cashel is a more is a more generic server that runs on all platforms. So if you go on GitHub, it's Cashel HTTP server, and it's used to say a development server. And for a very long time, we struggled with like putting that it was going to be a production server on on, on Linux. Um, you guys met Barry last year, right? If, if you guys were last year met Barry, Barry's our security guy, and he is just like in full panic because we have our own web server. I mean, tough, right? But he's supposed to be paranoid. That's his job. Um, has anyone tried to write a web server from scratch before? Don't, don't even, don't even try. I mean, Cashflow doesn't do anything. It literally is, we, we call it the byte pump. It gets bytes from, from the UV. It sends bytes, in, it, it turns bytes into request objects, and then it passes it up the stack. Just doing that really fast and doing it efficiently and securely is so hard. I mean, like, there's, like, pretty senior guys working on this thing, too, so, like, it feels like it shouldn't be that much work, but in, in the reality, to make a production, general purpose, secure server that supports SSL and supports all these things is really, really hard. And we're trying to actually like, get really high on the, the tech and power benchmarks. So anything that we change that has a slight, um, slight uh, tweak can actually affect performance in a very like, negative way or a very positive way. So I'm gonna show you this thing that we had. We had a, a review of Kestrel, a security review of Kestrel. And this is my amazing diagram. Can you guys see it? My handwriting is terrible, but but um, this is kind of the, the flow of Kestrel. This is the client sends a request. It goes through. It may go through a reverse proxy. It may not. It goes to libuv. Libuv is pretty much the byte pump. You, you, you say, here's the buffer. It's, it fills it up for you, and it calls you back saying, here's the buffer you passed in to me with data. Um, Kestrel has a memory pool, and it has a, a parser for HTTP. And all it does is it creates a feature collection and it calls through hosting, and then we invoke the application code. Use your code here. Um, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of attacks you can actually like, do to that, that basic flow where you're just passing in bytes, reading bytes, parsing objects. There's dot attacks where like, you, you can, it's called slow loris, where you can open a connection to a web server and send one byte per minute and just dot the server by like, having a, a, a connection open, sending like, one byte. And like servers like IIS and Nginx have actually guards against those things. So you probably want a front end server just in case, you know, for extra safety, um, because those things have been solved already. Um, we actually support HTTPS, I think, in maybe in RC1. It's not in beta 8. Um, we actually support HTTPS as a plugin to Kestrel. It's not actually in the box. You have to actually add it via package and say use HTTPS, and it will turn on HTTPS for Kestrel. Um, let's look at what it takes to write a server for HTTP.net. So there's a server called um, Noin on the interwebs. If you guys have seen this thing, it was a, a server written by a guy, Boris. I, I don't know him, but I know enough to know that he wrote this server. Um, it's a pure ON server in .NET. So this is a .NET based server, and we recently made this run on HTTP.NET 5, and it's, it's trivial to do. Um, there's an interface that you have to implement. Let's just show you the, there's a, Entropy is this repository we have that has a bunch of samples. Yeah, look at this thing. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, knowing hello world has the server factory. So to implement a server on SP.NET, you need to implement a nice server factory. And this guy has two functions, initialize and start. Um, initialize returns the feature collection for the actual server itself. The server can expose individual features as well as uh, features for itself. Um, it's a little different from the feature collection on the request. That, that's a pull request feature collection. This one is the f for the server itself. So they're the same concept, but different, different levels. So I can say this server supports WebSockets, or it doesn't. For example, on Windows 7, 
if you use IIS, there's no WebSockets because that's a Windows 8 feature. So you could have a web, the WebSocket feature say, it, I don't support it on Windows 7. Um, and start, we hand you an application delegate to call back whenever a request happens. And it's the server's job to call that server, to call that, um, that callback back whenever a request comes in via its mechanism. So uh, this is kind of like all the code required to adapt like Noen's ON server into an ASP.NET 5 server. And that's like all the code. Super convenient. Um, it is convenient that, that we do have this thing called an ON feature collection. Um, we, actually, we actually support ON in, in a first class way where you can take an ON server you can, or you can, and you can run ON middleware on an ASP.NET 5 server both directions without much code at all. So we do support running both layers um, on each other. It's kind of nice. All right, so let's take a, look, a deeper look now at some, some code. I made this Uber solution last night, just for the talk. Um, and what it is, is in ASP.NET 5, you can actually pull in source code from other projects into your project. So I, I just pull in a bunch of source code from all the projects required to build, to build um, an application. So we can step through all the layers and see what it takes to go from libuv all the way through to ASP.NET 5 into your, into your user code, uh, going through each layer. Um, the thing that joins everything together is Microsoft ASP.NET hosting. Hosting is kind of the, the I don't want to say the, it's, it's, it's where ASP.NET becomes itself again. So before we have all these desperate parts that, that, um, that live separately, the server itself is over here, and you have the application layer with the app builder and stuff. Hosting is the one that calls the application, configures it, builds the pipeline, configures services, uh, creates the server, starts listening on the server port, um, calls the application um, when request comes in, does stuff like handle telemetry when servers, um, when the request begins and request ends, it does logging. Um, so it's kind of the place where all the things come together to form like an actual application. So let's step through like how hosting works in general. So if I put a breakpoint in this application, and I have like, I think too many of them, but let's see if they actually all hit. So, debugging, okay. So we are in Microsoft uh, Server Catcher Programming. Let's start from the beginning. So my JSON file has a command called web, which I'm running which says the entry point is Microsoft ASP.NET Server Kestrel. So we're calling Kestrel's program in. So Kestrel has a program in inside of it. Um, what it does is it, it news up hosting's program in. It's kind of clever, but I'm crazy. And then passes in compiling arguments saying the server is Kestrel, the server is me. Um, that calls into this thing. Everyone can see this? Ah, I want to minimize this thing. That, we parse configuration here, we get the arguments, um, server Kestrel in hosting's main, and we create web host builder. This is kind of the API that hosting, that, that you can use in your application, in your own program main, to boot up the server. So you can say new, new web host builder, uh, configure the server, call build, and then you have your own server API, you can call start. It just so happens that hosting has a default main for you that does the same thing, so you don't have to do it yourself if you don't want to. Um, so I, I call start, and Start calls build application. Build application calls into instruct application services, which will call your configure configure services method. Um, calls startup, resolve services, ensure server. So it calls into the server abstraction layer. Uh, the server factory call passes in load this server. So it loads the Microsoft ASP.NET server Kestrel, tries to find a server factory in that assembly. Uh, and then it calls into it, calls initialize. It's dead, okay. This goes into Kestrel's server factory. Uh, I guess it's like freaking out. Um, Kestrel sets up a feature collection with, with, its, with, with its features. I server, Kestrel information is a feature and I server addresses feature is a feature. Um, this exposes a list of addresses that the server is bound to. In your application, you can actually get this feature and add more uh, things to listen to at, um, at, at runtime. It's kind of kind of cool. Um, and then we call initialize. That all is happy. Adding the default address because there was none done by default. 5,000 is the default. 
then we call application builder factory. This thing creates the actual application builder to pass into the configure method. Um, there are these things called I startup filters. This it's a service that lets you add middleware to the very beginning of the pipeline. Um, we have one by default that says, says the, the, the per request uh, services in your DI container. So if you do request services, we actually create a scope for you, a request scope for you, so you can actually access services per request. Um, go through the filters, compose the pipeline, and then we call configure, which calls your method configure, builds your pipeline using your middleware. Unwind, 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 unwind. We build the pipeline, so this guy builds the actual request delegate from the entire list. It goes through all the middleware in reverse order and composes them at the front and gets the application at the very end. So in the very end, what you have is a request delegate. And this delegate is the thing that the server can call into to actually invoke your pipeline. So you get the hosting engine, it gets a logger so it can log stuff. Um, I guess it's a telemetry source. This is a brand new API that they had in .NET. All this, this is all temporary. It's going to go away soon, I promise. Um, we call server.start. Server.start passes in to the server, the server's feature collection, and it passes, and it passes in delegate um, that actually has the server's feature collection exposed. So the server is supposed to implement a feature collection based on its knowledge of the request, but it doesn't understand the HTTP context at all. It understands its primitives. Um, so I'll hit F5, it started the actual server, and now if I hit make a request, make a request, what? Ah, yes. You get a, a prize if I had any. If I had a prize, you'd get a prize. 5,000. Yay. So I'm somewhere deep in uh, Kestrel. Um, Call start, this is all the BV stuff. We get back into hosting. Hosting has the service feature collection. This is, actual, uh, this is actually a, a Kestrel object. Um, we create a HTTP context based on that Kestrel object. And the logic is to just create a new default HTTP context. It's pretty simple. Um, but if you want to, you can actually override this service in your application and say, I have a very uh, fast version of this collection that I don't want you to use your version, use my version instead. So you can actually override parts of the system like, in, in all places. We get the trust identifier, which is a hex number. Um, and then we log stuff, and then we call the application with the HTTP context, and your request runs right here. So that is a walking through, and the request write happens. It goes back into Kestrel. So let me try to go one bit deeper. Uh, wait, did it actually? No. Let's try this. So I'm going to run this again. And this time I'm going to attach to DNX. Which one? It's always the first one. It's always the first one. That always works. Yeah, see? It's always the first one. I told you. Um, so now I actually have the source code for LibUV that I built on my machine. And uh, we're going to go like super deep just for fun. Because why not? It's, it's Saturday, right? And I think I have a breakpoint set somewhere relevant. Let's see if it hits. All right. So whenever a request comes in to the pipeline, in Kestrel, this is very to the Kestrel itself. Um, the, the API for LibUV is very node, node-esque. So it's, very, it's based on callbacks. So you call read start, and you pass in two callbacks, the callback to, to allocate a buffer and the callback to actually handle the read. So you say whenever they have buff the data for you, they say allocate a buffer of this size. And then you allocate it, you pass it to the BV, they fill it in for you, and then whenever the read is finished, they'll call you back with some data saying, you're done, you're done, you're done. Um, so nice. So VS can step from minus native code. It's actually really cool. The debugger is very powerful in, in, in um, Visual Studio. It actually calls through the uh, calls through the windsock, queues a read. Uh, it comes out the other side, processing the read. Um, LibUV is single-threaded. You can run different loops on different threads, but for the most part, it's single-thread. And they actually are, the code base is very, 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 very good. Um, they actually implement sockets very efficiently, so we actually use it for that. 
Um, we actually pass in a, a handle into native code that is a managed uh, connection. So we turn it back into a managed object when, it, when, they, when the callback comes back to us. So we get the actual object back, and then we call our callback, which then calls more stuff, which calls on read, which passes in like, you know, the, the amount it read, the error code, which is zero. There's no exception here, um, and the actual TCP handle. And it logs some stuff, and it, it says, well, so the way, our, the way UV works and the way our thing works today is we actually have a thread dedicated to, to allocating to, to IO. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm out of time, but I'm, I have to finish this because it's cool. So we, we have a thread uh, dedicated to IO that is pushing bytes onto a different thread that's parsing the, the, um, the header. So we have a custom like awaiter. Do you know you can write a custom awaiter in C Sharp? So if you do a wait blah, that thing that, that's awaitable can be anything that you want to be. Um, it's not to be a task. So what we did in libuv is we, in Kestrel, sorry, is we have this, this class called socket input. If I could find it, yep, socket input is implements this interface, iCritical notify completion. So this is awaitable. So the, the parsing loop awaits for data to come in on the socket. So we have like await socket. And then UV is pushing bytes on the actual um, pump. And it says trigger the, the, the completion whenever bytes come in. And the, the parsing loop goes as fast as it can, um, parses the bytes, and waits for more input to come. And, and that small change, taking the parsing off the UV thread, took the request per second from, I think it was 100,000 to 400,000. So you can see how like, these like, super small changes like, just make the perf go, go up like crazy. Um, um, that is, I think I'm out of time, but that is kind of, kind of nerdy and cool, I think. Um, <laughs> That's the, the life cycle of a request in an Istio application. Um, from the native layer into the managed layer into like your code, and we're trying to be as efficient as we can by not adding any overhead in the layers going up the stack. So, uh, yep, that's, that's it. And you can find me on Twitter if you want to ask me more questions. Uh, yeah, cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah,